Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Anxiety Book Club. I'm your host, Josh Molina, and this is episode 17. Joining me today is not the author of this month's book, which is a tremendous book that we'll get into, but a good friend of mine. The Anxiety Book Club aims to have authors on the podcast as much as possible, but sometimes they're unavailable or they're, you know, too famous. Like if I was going to read, you know, Bill Clinton's book, uh, you know, it'd probably be tough to get him on here. But in the true spirit of a book club, as it is, you know, originally understood, um, I have a friend. I have a friend who has agreed to read the book with me and we're going to discuss it today. So, Without further ado, I want to introduce my good friend, Nigel Tu. Uh, Nigel and me met many years ago back in Beijing when we were both on the comedy circuit, believe it or not, before I started getting serious. And now Nigel lives in, in England, uh, I think in, in Manchester or London, and he's a, a high school chemistry teacher. Did I get that right, Nigel? Close enough to London, somewhere called Watford, but it, it's, it's on the two map, so I guess that's fine. Well, what is it called, in case people want to come and say hello? <laughs> it's, it's called Watford. It's called Watford, so it's like slightly northwest. Watford. Yes, sir. Is that W-O-T-F-O-R-D? W-A-T. I think this might be our uh, transatlantic accent differentiations getting in the way of things. Oh, God. I hate yeah, that. We're just going to have to persevere, I think. <laughs> cool. Well, it's nice to have a couple different accents on the show today. So let's introduce the book now. So the book is a yellow book, and it's called Why Buddhism is True. And the author is Robert Wright. It says in the corner, it's a New York Times bestseller. So let me tell you a little bit about Robert Wright. According to his bio, he's a New York Times bestselling author of this book and also a few others. He is a psychologist and professor. He's taught psychology at Penn and at Princeton. Um, he's currently at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. He also has a website called bloggingheads.tv um, that I think is like a, a video um, sort of commentary site. And he's written for, you know, all the great magazines or newspapers, uh, The New Yorker, New York Times, Time, Wired, etc. And the book, Why Buddhism is True, is... You know, in my estimation, I don't want to bias the conversation too much, but for me, it's it's in a sort of a mind blowing read. I mean, the guest is not here for me to blow smoke up his butt, but here I am, anyways. I really, really enjoyed this book, and I think I enjoyed it so much because I've been sort of I've been on the you know meditative bandwagon for a few years now, and I come from a a non spiritual, non religious background, so anytime someone sits down to candidly describe what's going on in psychological or scientific terms, what's happening when we mem meditate. That's, um, that's always like a great, a great interest of mine. So, so that's the book and uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to start talking about it. Is there anything up at the top, uh, Nigel, you wanted to share? What I'd say is that I enjoyed this book up until a point. I think I sort of dropped off sort of 70 or 80 percent in not that i didn't um enjoy reading the whole thing but i think my sort of overall the satisfaction that gave me sort of drops near the end and my background is that i'm from a, a burmese family i moved to england when i was really young but i in the same way a lot of like white people are second or third generation in england over british Isles grow up ostensibly with a Christian background, I would argue that I grew up with like a Buddhist background. And in particular, like my mom, you know, has a very prominent role in a monastery in Manchester. So it is, it has always been sort of like a very strong background noise. Does that make sense? Definitely. And what, what do you, what, what would you say your relationship is with, you know, contemplative practice or, or mindfulness or meditation? Um, I've not really practiced like formally meditating. I'd say in a, uh, I think 
our friend Neil Farsa was the last person I meditated with. And so that was like six or seven years ago. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's charge forth into the book and, and sure, sure. Uh, hopefully our minds will cooperate. Mm. So I think one of the dominant th- themes of the book is that our minds and our brains evolved sort of just like every other part of our body. Right. With an eye towards procreation and getting our genes into the next generation. Mm-hmm. I think this is an important place to start the conversation because it allows us to maybe point a critical eye towards some of the things we think we think are are true and some of the things we think are false. Because at the end of the day, if natural selection, and this is to anthropomorphize uh, natural selection a little bit, if natural selection was going to make a decision between Evolving a brain that understands reality and sees the truth without, you know, a bias or a fog or a brain that's just good at, you know, talking to the lady on the street corner and getting her to agree to have babies. Every time natural selection is going to choose the latter, the latter path. So in some sense, we we needn't be surprised that in some ways our brains and our minds have these incredible shortcomings when it comes to seeing the truth or perhaps even being happy, because they weren't necessarily designed for that. I think that's a really good point in terms of when we study natural selection at a high school level, simplified in a sense, but it actually does make sense, you know, the struggle for existence, quotation marks, you're trying to firstly live long enough to hit a reproductive age and then reproduce. Um, It doesn't actually say anything about, you know, the amount of reproductive partners you have the quality of the child care it's just you reproduce you pass on your genes so according to robert wright given our our brains and our minds and natural selections main motivation in this picture we may in some ways be deluded uh, or confused or not able to see the truth and so one of the promises of the book and of meditation and mindfulness overall is that if we you know become diligent students it's possible that we will be less deluded. So I want to dig in a little bit here to to see what exactly it is Robert Wright thinks that we are confused or deluded about because, you know, the average Joe or or me and you might look around and and think that we understand things pretty well. You know, I'm I'm a human, I have a body, I have a job, I've got a podcast, I have friends, we're talking right now, all those things seem to be true. So what, like if Robert Wright was here, what I would ask him is, you know, what are the things that we're actually confused about? Is that a question you want me to, are we role-playing and I'm Robert Wright? Or I'm <laughs> Do you feel like Robert Wright? <laughs> I, looking at a picture of him, I, I certainly don't feel like Robert Wright. You don't feel like him. Okay, no, that's fine. It's not, It's either, if you had a ready answer, then I would welcome it. But I also, um, I was going to read from the book where he talks about some of these elements of delusion. Sure, please go ahead. Okay. So one one kind of delusion is the overestimation of how much happiness uh, sensory pleasures will bring. So Robert Wright says that he really likes powdered donuts. And I don't know if you have these in the UK, but and I don't I'm not particularly fond of them here, but I'm pretty sure they're these small donuts and they're maybe white from powdered sugar. Um, and they probably come in a box with a whole bunch of others. Are, are you familiar with this donut yeah, phenomenon? for sure. Okay. So our, our good friend, um, Robert Wright, is a huge fan of these. But he says that there's a, a delusion somewhere in his estimation of just how good they are. So he writes on page six. He says, so what exactly is the illusory part of pursuing donuts or sex or consumer goods or a promotion? There are different illusions associated with different pursuits, but for now, we can focus on one illusion that's common to all these things, the overestimation of how much happiness they bring. Again, by itself, this is delusional only in a subtle sense, right? It's not like seeing, you know, Tupac or Biggie Smalls in the mirror, if you say their name enough, or a -hmm. a flying dragon overhead. These are more subtle delusions. And that's me speaking, not, not Robert Wright, but back to the book. 
If I asked you whether you thought that getting that next promotion or getting an A on that next exam or eating that next powdered sugar donut would bring you eternal bliss, you'd say no, obviously, obviously not. On the other hand, we do often pursue such things with, at the very least, an unbalanced view of the future. We spend more time envisioning the perks that promotion will bring than envisioning the headaches. And there may be an unspoken sense that once we've achieved this long-sought goal, once we've reached the summit, we'll be able to relax, or at least things will be enduringly better. Similarly, when we see that donut sitting there, we immediately imagine how good it tastes, not how intensely we'll want another donut only moments after eating it, or how we'll feel a bit tired or agitated later when the sugar rush subsides. What do you think of this example, Nigel? I think it's a good example just to, to say, not to overemphasize the end point of your goals. Does that make sense? In terms of, for example, I got pretty good like exam scores in high school. And I remember opening my envelope as a 16-year-old being like, oh, these are good scores. And I felt an elation. But, you know, in England, when you're 16, the GCSEs are theoretically the culmination of your high school studies for like five years and there's no way that five years of intermittently studying resting whatever is going to give me conversely five years of intermittent elation if that mm. makes sense. i think one thing that he goes on to explain you know in the next page actually about how we're just driven to or wired up as beings through natural selection to sort of chase little goals and then create a sculpt a bigger picture sort of profile for ourselves as beings or organisms but i think it it really um it sort of lends itself to the idea that we need to sort of mindfully be in the now whatever we're doing and then those goals will come but sort of viewing time as just a series of moments we have to focus on the now and then that will take care of the future which then becomes the past yeah yeah i i think i think you got it um and i i agree i think a really topical example i can think of right now and this might be a little extreme but there's a lot of people out there really counting on getting that covid vaccine mm. i can think of my parents in particular who have lived a mostly secluded life and imagine that on the day or the weeks following the vaccine, somehow, you know, things will be so much better or, or enduringly better as you gave the example of, you know, five years of study leading to five years of, you know, bliss or, or contentment. Yeah. So, so perhaps in those cases, in the cases that you imagine it also in these smaller cases about the donut, there is an overestimation of just how long, you will feel good for after achieving a certain goal. I think another example to echo your point is sort of everyone just thought, okay, 2020 is over, but we're, we're going to be a couple, three or four months into 2021. And it's still a continuation, but we just all on social media or on the news or whatever, we gave ourselves this brief sort of glimpse of hope. I was like, Oh, well that's over. And then something good's going to happen when really just, time passed and a pandemic is still going on. Right. And as you said, if, if we can bring ourselves, and this is sort of the motivation for, you know, getting into meditation, if we can bring ourselves to enjoy the moments instead of the future, um, perhaps there's, uh, you know, some happiness that we, we've left on the shelf or left on the table um, because we're so focused on some, goal or or point in the future that we haven't reached yet um maybe there's there's more worth savoring um in this moment to moment experience but you brought up another point that i think is really interesting and feeds into the the basic sort of naturalistic point of view of this book which is very much about evolution which is if you were natural selection and here we are uh bringing up another point that you you said you wanted to talk about uh anthropomorphizing natural selection if you were natural selection and you were trying to build a human specifically build a human brain so that they would feed themselves and that they would have sex. Um, do you remember from 
uh, the book, it's, I think it's the next page you were suggesting, what, what properties of mind would be useful to get the human to do that over and over again? Um, is, isn't it on page seven? Yeah. And that it's, so I think it's on page seven and he lists them. So I'm only going to paraphrase, but it just says, achieving goals should bring pleasure. And then the second one is about the pleasure is temporary. Because if it was just ongoing and everlasting, you'd just be comatosed based on a sugar donut or a set of exam results or whatever. And so it would, you know, make you lazy. And then, so the third one is a little bit more of an involved explanation, but the animal's brain focuses more on the fact that pleasure accompanies the reaching of a goal than on the fact that pleasure shortly dissipates afterwards. So actually sort of the anticipation is what gives you more focus than the actual the actual feeling of a pleasure and sort of its dissipation. In fact, there was a sort of an indie band called Franz Ferdinand who um they were describing writing songs and they were talking about when they play a song live, it's not when the main riff hits you that the crowd are the most excited. It's in the build up before you know, the first time you hit that like anthemic chorus or something. I think it's kind of like um, the way he described it in the interview was it's kind of like on a roller coaster, that exhilaration of being scared, the anticipation before you do the big dip or the breakneck speed loops. That's what's really exciting, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So yeah, so it's the anticipation and, and the moment of bliss or uh, you know, orgasm or whatever that people are after. But most of us don't walk around saying like, hey, uh, Nigel, um, you know, I can't wait until uh, right after we finish having sex. That's going to be the best when it's done. You know, people don't, people don't speak that way. Um, and, and they shouldn't according to our construction, because if, if it were the case that the pleasure lasted forever, like you said, either we'd be lazy or we just wouldn't do it again. Like, if we were cows in a field and eating that blade of grass was enough to give us pleasure, you know, infinitely or for a year, we wouldn't keep eating and we would die. So mm -hmm. um, they're designed to be short and they're designed, I guess, I don't know, according to him or according to others, they're designed to keep you coming back for more. Have you ever heard the trade, uh, phrase hedonic treadmill? Oh, hey. Yes. Yeah. I th I'm not sure if he uses a book because I have on my notes. I've written it down. I'm not sure if it was from the book or not, but it's you know, every all the pain you go through on a treadmill, but something in your brain, and again, this is with the tallying of time. Something in your brain releases a shot of endorphins when you hit one kilometer, two, three, four, five, and so. But the pain is worth the pleasure, you know. So, so in this example, you're you're talking about a literal treadmill, right? Oh yeah, no, but I'm I'm just saying in terms of just pursuing goals. Mm -hmm. And I think the hedonic treadmill can also apply to just wanting another donut and yeah. another donut and another one. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's important to say that, at least from my perspective, that I'm and I don't think Robert Wright is making value judgments. Um, if anything, it's giving us an excuse to realize why we are the way we are because we were designed to be this way. Would you say, would you think it was accurate for me to go on my definition and say meditation is a way to sort of cultivate or streamline more of the facets of your mind to work sort of together and more harmoniously? Well, that's actually an interesting thing to say. And it, it kind of hits on a point that is much later in the book but is, is maybe worth bringing up now. And that's this idea that the brain is organized into these modules that are all competing for your attention. This is some of the most interesting stuff, I think, in the book. Um, because a lot of us walk around thinking that we're running the show and we're the, we're the thinkers of our thoughts. We're, the, we're directing the movie. But according to, you know, the Buddhist canon and Robert Wright here, it's much more likely that, in fact, the thoughts are thinking themselves and whichever thought um, reaches your consciousness so that you feel like you've made it 
has landed there via some competition amongst the different modules of your brain. So if, if your definition of meditation uh, involves this idea of trying to bring harmony to the brain, I think that pairs somewhat well with his definition of this modular structure of the brain, because if, if there's less contention and maybe there's less conflict in the modules, or at least um, you can mediate that conflict by being more mindful, then, then I would say there, there would be more harmony. Mm -hmm. And I think what, there was a description on page 78 as well. So I know we're jumping ahead a bit. There was a, a, dis a description, but I wrote down on my notes, bonsai tree your mind. And I think you might think that's actually a crude representation of, of meditation. But I, I also... I also think that's a decent way to describe it to a 10 year old. I don't know your thoughts on that. The definition is what about a tree? I, I said, I just wrote on page 78 with regards to uh, meditation. I just wrote bonsai tree or mind. So like on a bonsai tree, you cut off any roots that aren't growing properly. You cut off any um, areas of disease. And like, I know we're getting very vague here, but that idea of the harmoniousness and you need to, and I think there, there's a lot of sort of dualities, I think, in interpretations of Buddhism, if you'll allow me to get onto this sidetrack. So the idea that you're meditating, sort of, like you said, I think a big Western misconception is like, oh, you're just thinking about nothing and you're being nothing or you're focusing on nothingness. When actually what you could be perceived to be doing is actually you're settling your mind so i think i've discussed with you another time the idea of your mind being like a mixture of mud and water in a glass and the way you think sort of in real world life and in your sort of hustle and bustle of daily life it gets cluttered and muddied even more but i think meditation perhaps in this analogy is a way for you to sort of allow the mud to settle and allow for you to see clear water. I think that's a decent metaphor. A lot of people talk about the benefits of meditation, being able to see things more clearly, um, you know, including Robert Wright, but let's, let's um, drill down now that we've started talking about this idea of the modular mind and the self. I want to talk about some of these really interesting scientific experiments um, sort of in the area of 78, 79, yeah. that Robert Wright talks about that demonstrates maybe some misconceptions that we hold about self-consciousness and who we are. So I'll just read here and I'll, I'll try to not read the whole thing to just move it along. But so Robert Wright writes on page 78, among the most dramatic are the famous split brain experiments. These were done with people whose left and right brain hemispheres had been separated via surgery that severed the bundle of fibers connecting them. This is for people who have really bad epilepsy. Mm. So this process, uh, it doesn't hurt the people, but it does lead to something really, really interesting. So just a little primer here on the way the hemispheres work. So um, let's see where he writes this. The key was to confine information to a single hemisphere by presenting it to only half of the patient's visual field. If, for example, a word is presented only to the left visual field, so your left eye, which is processed by the right hemisphere, it won't enter the left hemisphere at all. So most of us are walking around, have this, I think it's called the corpus callosum, and it's the thing connecting our left and right hemispheres. Yeah. So that if some information enters our left eye, which is controlled by our right hemisphere, it still makes it over to the left hemisphere via this network of fibers. Mm -hmm. But in these patients that that highway of, of traffic of, um, you know, neurons firing has been severed. And so in some sense, two separate worlds are sort of occurring at the same time in these people, according to what um, is presented to them on the left or right half of their body, specifically through their eyeballs. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's read from the, some of the dramatic examples, um, here in the book. So it's the left hemisphere that in most people controls language. Sure enough, patients whose right hemisphere is exposed to say the word nut report no awareness of this input. 
So let me read that again. Patients whose right hemisphere is exposed to say the word nut report no awareness. So the right hemisphere doesn't have language in it. So if you ask someone about this thing presented to them and it wasn't presented to the area of the brain that does control language, they're not able to report that they've seen it. Mm -hmm. But he writes in this next sentence, yet their left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, will, if allowed to rummage through a box containing various objects, choose a nut. So why, what, like, what's, so what? Like, what's the point? Like, who cares? So, so you took a person whose brainstem is severed, or not brainstem, uh, their corpus callosum is severed, and you show one of their eyeballs a nut, but that's not the part of the brain that can speak. So if you ask him, hey, like, did anyone show you a nut today? He has, he can't, he's like, no, I didn't see any nuts. But if you then let him put his hand in a box with a bunch of random things, like a picture of a horse or a, a kitty cat or a water bottle, he will pick the nut out, but he won't really be able to explain um, in a sort of truthful or satisfactory way why he chose the nut. Hmm. Um, I know this is, I had to read this passage a couple of times and I think it's like a, it could be a little bit um, confusing at point at, at some points, what the, so what factor is like, who cares? Do you want to chime in at all here, Nigel? You know what? I had to actually, um, cause I have a chemistry degree, but I have to, phone my friend who has a biology degree and sort of double check it for him or with him sorry and have him talk me through this section of the book or in particular the split brain experiments that's probably the one section of the book that I think maybe he's not given enough background information um, to make it 100% clear. The punchline here is that if if through these experiments we've been able to expose the sort of divisibility of consciousness Mm -hmm. So that we use, we think of consciousness and self-consciousness as one thing, like I am this person and there's not two of me and there's not 10 of me. But in these experiments with these people whose, um, you know, corpus callosum has been severed, you could make the argument that there's two people there. Okay. There's the guy who knows about the nut, you know, uh, and there's a guy that doesn't, but really there's just one, one man, one person sitting in front of you. So let's just read one more paragraph from this chapter that might make it a little bit clear. So Robert Wright writes, that finding alone could make you start questioning traditional notions of the conscious self. Now consider this one. When the left hemisphere is asked to explain behavior initiated by the right hemisphere, it tries to generate a plausible story. If you send the command walk to the right hemisphere of these patients, they will get up and walk. Right. So the right hemisphere is happy to do motor commands. It's just not good at language. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them where they're going, the answer will come from the left hemisphere where language is, which wasn't privy to the command. So you you cover someone's um, right eyeball and you show their left eyeball, which is accessing their right hemisphere. You show them the word walk, W-A-L-K. And because that hemisphere is good enough at getting people to move their bodies, they start walking. But then if you ask them where they're going, which is a question, and the question is made of language, so it's just going to go to the left hemisphere, that person never saw the word walk. So you might think they would respond, oh, I don't know where I'm going. But here Robert Wright writes, the hemisphere will come up with what, from its point of view, is a reasonable answer. One man replied, plausibly enough, that he was going to get a soda. And the person who comes up with the improvised explanation, or at least the person's left hemisphere, the part of the person that's doing the talking, seems to believe the story. So just think about this for one, one, more, one more time. You show someone's right hemisphere the word walk, they start walking. Then you ask them why they're walking. In, 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 in truth, they have no idea, right? Or their left hemisphere has no idea. But you ask them and they give you immediately, without hesitation, they give you a response, oh, I'm going to get a soda. So it's obviously they weren't going to get a soda, like they're going because you told them to walk, but the left hemisphere didn't know this. I get what you mean. I think, yeah, it, it's hard. So, yeah, so it's part of a larger argument that is supposed to get us to believe that the self maybe doesn't exist. Yeah, so I mean, do you interpret it the same way I do in about, there's actually, in that split brain experiments, there's sort of two beings within one when you sever a corpus callosum and they're sort of acting synchronously but also asynchronously yes okay yes yeah exactly yeah 
which is crazy because you know it, you know if i told you hey nigel i'm gonna come over there and i'm gonna chop you know this highway part of your brain out then all of a sudden i'll have two friends instead of one you'd be like uh, what <laughs> i never thought about it like that but i, I think that you know perversely that makes sense too doesn't it <sighs> I mean, I'm kind of interested in the possibility because I could use a little more Nigel in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to backtrack now. I want to go backwards to page 29 yeah. because um, I want to talk about feelings because mm-hmm. they feelings are really important, at least for me, yeah. because I think they've gotten in a way of of a lot of what I want my life to look like. Because you know, hence hence the name of the podcast, Anxiety Book Club. I have a chronic anxiety disorder. I feel anxiety all the time for reasons that are not related to harm to my body or a threat of death. You know, I live in a nice apartment. I have a lock on my door. My roommate's pretty nice. Like on a daily basis, no one is trying to kill me. And yet I have these feelings, these feelings of anxiety all the time. And so, you know, it's kind of been my mission with this podcast and more or less my life's work to figure out how to manage, um, this sort of difficult mental situation. Mm-hmm. So, so this chapter about feelings I thought was really compelling yeah. about what they are and, and why they evolved. Okay, so here's this is about the evolution of feelings or why we have them. Regardless of when feelings first arose, there is a rough consensus among behavioral scientists on what the original function of good feelings and bad feelings was. To get organisms to approach things or avoid things that are respectively good for them or bad for them. Nutrients, for example, keep organisms alive. So natural selection favored genes that gave organisms feelings that led them to approach things containing nutrients, that is, food. Things that harm or kill organisms, in contrast, are best avoided. So natural selection gave organisms feelings that inclined them to avoid such things feelings of aversion. To approach or to avoid is the most elemental behavioral decision there is, and feelings seem to be the tool natural selection used to get organisms to make the right decision. And and just a little instructive example here, he writes, after all, your average animal isn't smart enough to think, hmm, that substance is rich in carbohydrates, which gives me energy, so I'll make a habit of approaching and ingesting it. In fact, Your average animal isn't even smart enough to think food good for me, so I approach. Mm -hmm. So feelings arose as proxies for this kind of thinking. Yeah, it's sort of, I think it does echo my point that I made previously is like feelings, feelings don't actually have a morality attached to them, or I don't, they're not inherently good or bad. They're just sort of electrochemical signals that the brain sends to help you try and survive but i think i think what's distorted in our sort of age of plentifulness even within you know this global pandemic we're facing is that uh we've evolved too fast but i I don't want to be getting off track but i think in terms of the title of the segment of a chapter is called when are feelings illusions and i wrote down on my notes my summation or my interpretation of what he said is um feelings are true if your response benefits you or feelings are false if your response leads to drawback um yes is is that generally how you would interpret that part of the book it, definitely i think that's exactly the point he's making so so there's a couple of points here one is that nat and we're personifying or, or anthropomorphizing natural selection again but natural selection needed to figure out a way to get people to eat or get to animals to eat and so these ephemeral things that we all might have different relationships to these things, so-called things called feelings. They may or may not be the same as emotions that might be slightly different, but they're sort of shortcuts or kind of heuristics to getting the organism to approach things that are good for it and to stay away from things that are bad from it. You see this, you know, in a very basic sense in a Petri dish. Um, You know, if you put an amoeba in a Petri dish and you put a poison in there, it will avoid that. Right. And so, Who knows what's going on in the, I I don't think you could say the mind or the nervous system of that amoeba, but Mm -hmm. there's some sense of aversion um, occurring such that the amoeba doesn't approach. And it's not going to be like linguistic. It's not going to be a sentence 
for the amoeba. It's not going to be like, hey, that is poison. I've read in books that poison's bad for me. I'm going to avoid it. No, it's going to be a much simpler sort of heuristic in this sense of feeling. And, and yes, um, the title of the chapter is When Are Feelings Illusions? And I think you've nailed it completely. Uh, it may be the case that natural selection's principle in evolving feelings or, or the fact that we have feelings is, is a little bit outdated in some contexts insofar as sometimes feelings lead us to things that are actually not good for us, which is what I think you were talking about. If, if they're good for us, then maybe the feelings are in some sense true. And if they're bad for us, they're not. So the sixth or seventh sugared donut is not good for us. Maybe the third or the fourth, or perhaps even the second is not good for us. And yet the feeling persists that we want more and more. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that match up with what you were trying to say? Yeah. And I think, I think, yeah. And it does even just to try and stretch out a bit more. I think it feeds into sort of the idea of, um, so there is no, there is no moral mandate. There's no intrinsic morals and such. And that we have to kind of, for want of a better term, feel it out. Um, through mindfulness and other practices. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is sort of a more later on, but um, through mindfulness, like you're saying, you might be able to give yourself enough space so that when feelings arise, you can decide whether or not they're useful instead of sort of just acting on them, you know, as we say, mindlessly. Or I think it also feeds into like, the next time I wrote a note that I felt was re- relevant of writing is um, sort of um, it went all the way to page fifty nine, and it okay. was just, it was about the non self and how feelings sort of feelings can guide you falsely down a road. I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this and I have to do this, and sort of an over emphasis on trying to avoid things that we don't like and an overemphasis on trying to indulge in things we do like, like with a powdered donuts thing leads us to bad things. Yeah. Like uh, obesity or high blood pressure, diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. So natural selection evolved or we evolved in context, very different, as you said, uh, than the context in which we live today. And so, it might be useful to be mindful of feelings that might have been useful on the plains of the savanna when the sweetest thing to eat was a piece of fruit mm-hmm. um, versus now when that's obviously not the case. Well, yeah, I think we evolved too quick. We evolved to possibly society or the sort of benefits that the technology that is available to society has allowed us to earn an existence that we don't deserve. I don't know if you agree with that. I don't know if I would speak to like concepts of dessert, you know, what, what we deserve or not deserve, but I think maybe you're saying that it's not an easy road to walk. The one that the roads that we've built for ourselves in this modern technological society with. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we, we've sort of overloaded ourselves with all this stimulus information and all this sort of new stuff in the system. There's a sort of science, science concept called equilibrium where we talk about, a system and then you change the system and then so you might increase the temperature or you might add more reactant or products and then the system tries to sort of reverse the change but i think in terms of globally how interconnected we are together the system's undergone so many changes and it keeps undergoing changes that we can't seem to sort of reach a resting state we're always sort of overexcited about the next new technological development or the latest sort of war or dispute between two foreign countries, you know? Yeah. He, he actually goes into, and I, I don't have many notes on it, but he does talk a lot about tribalism and the dangers there that have a lot to do with delusions about mm-hmm. seeing things that don't actually exist. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kind of getting close to the top of the hour um, and there's a, there's a lot in this book that I don't think we're going to be able to, to get to, but I want to end, I want to end with some kind words he writes about natural selection. Cause we've been kind of beating up on it 
Um, and I, I've got a bone to pick with natural selection, but of course that's the reason we're here in the first place. So maybe I'll just, I'll just read a little bit here. So he says, so yes, we can think of natural selection as somewhat like those robot overlords in the matrix perpetrating a pervasive and oppressive illusion on behalf of an agenda that we have every right to reject. If looking at things this way helps you, helps give you the determination it takes to sustain a serious meditation practice, by all means, look at things this way. At the same time, it is in the spirit of Buddhism to be skeptical of demonizing anyone or anything. So let me say a few kind words about natural selection. It did create sentient life, and sentient life can be a wonderful thing. Indeed, the bliss that is said to be part of true enlightenment wouldn't be possible without sentience. Neither would the more modest growth of happiness that can be had with more modest progress along the meditative path. You might even say that sentience is what gives life meaning and makes it a matter of moral concern. Certainly, Buddhism's moral emphasis on respect for sentient beings wouldn't make much sense if there weren't any sentient beings around. So I, I want to I just ask sort of globally uh, for you, Nigel, if this book has uh, changed or confirmed or uh, disaffirmed or uh, your feelings about meditation or mindfulness or Buddhism or, or, or any of that. No, I think there are parts of it de that definitely resonate strongly with how I perceive and interpret sort of things and ways of being. Um, there's a lot of, um, I think, sort of dualities in the book. You know, there's a part where he says that writing the book in itself and over-intellectualizing on Buddhism might actually be sort of a drawback or might actually be um, counter-constructive to spreading the message of meditation and enlightenment. Uh, do you remember that passage? I do. I do remember that I made a note there too because his, his teacher at a retreat was re a little bit reluctant to intellectualize it because of those very concerns. Yeah. Um, I was glad that he did win the day and wrote the book because otherwise we wouldn't have had this, you know, this text. Oh yeah, and I, but I think I think the the more he engages into detail, um, and intellectualizes, it's sort of near the end. The more I sort of take a step back, um, but I think these are the strange things we have to do, deal with, um, in terms of getting into this like sort of metaphysical realm of thinking, um, logically. You know, have you ever heard of the? Um, I know he says that the supernatural elements of Buddhism. Um, aren't useful and he's not going to mention it but have you ever heard of the bodhisattva vow no what is that so bodhisattvas are these beings in mahayana buddhism so like that's more sort of chinese and other sort of newer buddhism a supernatural being who delays their own enlightenment by helping other people reach enlightenment but then paradoxically the helping of other people reach enlightenment speeds up their own enlightenment. Oh, so maybe he's one of those bodhisattva people, huh? Maybe, maybe he is. He looks very different to the to the pictures and models I grew up seeing. But um, no, I think um, no, I think we've really not done the book justice, obviously. Because, but I don't think an hour is like we could probably speak an hour on each separate chapter, you know, but. There's a lot here. Yeah. I found this book to be, you know, really enlightening and, and also encouraging um, mm -hmm. to continue down the path. Thank you so much, Nigel, for accompanying me on this journey and reading the book and being the first, you know, uh, participant on the podcast that's just really a member of the book club. I really appreciate that. No, no, thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been far too short. I've enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs>